Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, so the first time I met my biological mother, it was at a rest stop on the Garden State Parkway. Uh, it was 2013. I was 46. I've always known I was adopted. I've known I was adopted since I've known my name is Jim, or Jimbo, as I was called as a kid. That's President Jimbo to you in case. <laughs> I didn't know anything about the circumstances because it was through Catholic charities and so it was a closed adoption. The only story I knew was a story my mom would tell on occasion about when she and my dad went to pick me up from the hospital, I was nine days old. And she said a nun brought me into the room where they were waiting and I was wearing an Irish hand-knit sweater and a St. Christopher medal. And St. Christopher is the patron saint of travelers. And my mom asked the nun where these came from, and the nun teared up. And my mom usually teared up when she got to this point in the story. And the nun said, I can't tell you. I can only tell you that they come from someone who loves him very much. This would usually lead my mom to break down sobbing. Um, and you would think that this would have made me curious, but it didn't, actually. I was never that curious about my birth parents. My parents had always said, if you ever want to try to find them, we'll help you, but I never did. Part of that is that um, I had a wonderful childhood. I had two parents who loved me, a sister who tolerated me most of the time. <laughs> I had friends, we had a week at the Jersey Shore. I didn't feel like I was missing anything. I wasn't resentful, I was vaguely grateful. I figured this must have been a difficult thing to do. So fast forward, uh, to about six years ago, I was out running with a friend who was trying to find his father. And by this point, both of my parents had passed away. And he said, you should try to find something out about your birth parents. And I said, you know, I've never been that curious. And now I would feel slightly disloyal because both of my parents had passed away. But he persisted. And so to appease him, I said, OK, I'll look into it. So for the first time ever, I sat down and I um, Googled Catholic Charities, and within an hour, I discovered that Catholic Charities would actually now, they must have changed their policies, would now give non-identifying information, that is, any information in their files about the adoption except for last names, because they wouldn't um, allow you, they wouldn't um, give you the last name. Um, and then if you sent in a check, because this is the Catholic Church after all, um, <laughs> I say that as a, as a Catholic, um, <laughs> they would um, send you the information. So I, I, I found out the Catholic charities to which I was adopted. I called them, and turns out, yes, this is true, and yes, they have my file. So within an hour, I thought, oh, I'm going to find out something that I never knew. I always thought I figured the story was two teenagers, so part of the reason I wasn't that curious is I thought I knew the story. So about a month later, I get a three-page letter that's made from notes from the file, and it was not at all what I expected. It read like a 19th century novel about um, an Irish immigrant. It turns out um, that my birth mother, Anne, uh, grew up in Ireland, part of a very large family, came to the US following her brother, and lived and worked um, with a wealthy family in New York City. The letter said that she did not want to give me up for adoption and cried every time it was brought up, but that ultimately realized she couldn't afford to keep me and certainly couldn't keep the job that she had and keep me. I learned that she knit during, my, during her pregnancy, which accounted for the sweater. I learned that she stayed in the hospital with me all nine days and fed me all my meals. And I learned from the letter's last line that she left the hospital brokenhearted. I handed this letter to my wife, Katie, who read it, and with tears coming down her cheek, said, you need to find her. You need to find her and let her know that everything turned out OK. And I said, I think you're right. So Catholic Charities will do a search for you for an additional fee. <laughs> So I planned to call Catholic Charities, but instead, the next day, I got a call from them, a woman named Barb, I think that was her name, um, who called. She made up some excuse for calling, and she had a great New Jersey accent, which I can't do justice to, but she said, Jim, I got to tell you, I've been doing this for 25 years, and I ate, 
I ain't never come across a story like this. It touched my heart, Jim. Jim, do you hear what I'm telling you? <laughs> it touched my heart. Now, I can't tell you to find her because that costs more money, and you know that costs more money. <laughs> but Jim, don't you think she's wondering about you? And I had never thought about that. And I said, I would like you to find her, and then we talked about she'd probably move back to Ireland. We didn't know whether she'd even be alive. So at this point in the story, I'm now interviewing for a job at Harvard. We had lived in Charlottesville for 15 years, um, and we were contemplating the possibility that we would move from Charlottesville to, um, to Massachusetts, and I would start a new job and move all four of our kids who were not that excited about moving. Um, and I spent a lot of time talking to Drew Faust, who was then the president of Harvard. You saw her speak yesterday if you were at the inauguration, and it matters that Drew is female. So a Thursday night in June 2013, uh, I get a call at 5 o'clock from Drew Faust offering me the job. So I'm now thinking we are moving, and my head is spinning, and I'm thinking about um, how we're going to move our entire family from a place that we love. 9 a.m. the next morning, I pick up the phone. It's Barb. And she says, Jim. I said, yes. She says, are you sitting down? I said, no. She says, Jim, sit down. <laughs> and she says, we found her. And because I had been thinking so much about Drew Faust, I thought she was going to say, your mother's Drew Faust. <laughs> But she told me something equally surprising. It turns out um, that my mother had married a wonderful man named Jack and had four additional children, um, had moved from New York to New Jersey, and had lived most of my life 15 minutes from where I grew up. And then she said, Barb said, Jim. And you know what she told me? And I said, no. She said. She told me that she's prayed for you every day of your life and that her only prayer was that someday you two would meet in heaven. And then she said, Jim, I can't tell you to call her, but do you think you would call her? <laughs> so, so I said, yes, I'll call her. Um, so I called the next day, um, and Jack, a, a truly wonderful man, answered the phone. And before he could say anything, I blurted something out like, I'm not crazy. I don't need money. <laughs> I'm not emotionally needy. <laughs> not really, anyway. <laughs> um, I'm just calling because I wanted to say thanks um, and let you know that everything turned out OK. I'm happy. I have a wonderful family. And I could hear Jack smiling on the other end of the phone. And he said, Jim, she's been waiting a long time for this. And she's the most amazing person I've ever met. So then we talked. And it was um, both surreal and totally ordinary. And we agreed to meet when we, were dri when, when we would be driving from Charlottesville to Massachusetts, hence meeting on the Garden State Parkway, where if you're from New Jersey, that's the natural place to meet. <laughs> So we're driving. This is the morning that we are leaving our home in Charlottesville to go to Massachusetts. Um, and our kids um, were only vaguely interested in this story at this point because the much bigger story to them is that they're leaving their childhood home. And they also adored my mother, their grandmother, and weren't quite sure what to make of this new person. And I had seen Anne's picture, so I was prepared for this, but my kids hadn't. And we walk into the rest stop, and their mouths drop open because there is no doubt <laughs> um, that we're related. So we sat and talked for two hours, um, and Anne held my hand for most of the two hours, showed me pictures, had cards for each of our kids with their names on it, and $20 in each card. Um, ice cream money for the summer, she said. <laughs> I eventually met um, my four siblings, uh, and they completely welcomed me into their lives. Um, I will tell you, this is not a bridge 
I ever expected to cross, um, but it has enriched my life in so many ways. And it's one of the reasons I think building bridges is so important. And this weekend, um, we built yet another bridge between my extended family, who are all here, um, and my birth family. Thank you.